Okay, let's find Psalm 51 tonight. Psalm 51 in your Bibles. When you find it, let's stand. And we will read verses 1 and 2 together. You follow along in your Bible. Psalm 51. Hmm. So I have some notes in my Bible. Here's what my notes say. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And then the title of this section also notes, it says, A Plea for Forgiveness. So as we look at Psalm 51 tonight, I want you to recognize this is a very, a very somber time. This is a very serious time. Psalm 51 is a very important chapter in the Bible. It's a very serious thing that happened that brought David to this point, And it's a very valuable lesson for us to learn from it. And so that's what we're doing Wednesday nights. So um, as we look at this, recognize um, it's, it's, as, it's as personal and it's as serious as it could be. Psalm 51, verses 1 and 2. Follow along in your Bible. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time in your word. Help us to learn and glean, find the, find the treasures that are here in Psalm 51 for us. Thank you for um, letting us peek into the life of David where he learned something wonderful that he could be restored and walk with you again. Pray you'll speak to hearts tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The way back to God. That's our series. The way back to God. This is the story of my soul is the title of this lesson too. So his introduction, David's heart cry in Psalm 51, it's known as the sinner's guide back to God. The sinner's guide back to God. We all have a story to tell. It is the story of our souls. Our Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9. So David went through this whole transition. And, you know, I wonder sometimes, what was it like when, when David um, was, was walking in the perfect will of God? When David was in the center of God's will, when David had a heart after God's own heart, when David wrote songs and played the instruments and, and poured, him, poured himself out to God, what was that like? Have I ever felt a little of what David felt? Have I ever experienced that, that love and that appreciation and that gratitude the way David did? I hope you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Live your life in obedience to Him. Here's a quotation for you. When you are no longer in fellowship with Christ, find your way back to God. Amen. Amen. One of the most amazing personalities in all of human history is King David. If you travel in the Middle East today, centuries, almost a couple thousand years since he lived, people still speak of King David. The flag of the nation of Israel has on it the star of David. His image is impressed upon that nation even to this day. Very few men have ever lived and influenced as many as he did. You know, for a while, David ruled and he built his own kingdom. That kingdom is still there. You can go to that place. You can visit that place. You can see the the walls, you can see some of the rooms, you can see the layout, you can see where the water flows through it. It's still there today. Even the bridge that we passed when Joni and I visited the Holy Land, it's a, it's a uh, I would say, average-sized bridge, but the way they built it with the architecture, they made it with a lot of cables, and it looks like a harp, like David would play the harp to the Lord. So that was the inspiration. So David is somebody in history who is very rare. We all have a story to tell. 
In Psalm 51, David opened his heart and he poured out his soul. Let me pause here for a minute. All of us have sinned in the past. All of us have some regrets in the past. How would we feel if some of our worst sin was published? If it was written about in the newspaper? If it was talked about on the news broadcast? What if your sin was the first page on Facebook? Here is the sin of Brother Bolton. Oh, can you imagine how bad you would feel? if your sin was known to everybody. And yet God used David's terrible sin for us to all learn from. David was opening the door of his soul, publicly declaring, come inside and see the darkest day of my life. Come inside and view something that I wish to God had never taken place. I thought it was a secret but God recorded it in His eternal word so that millions may witness my terrible tragedy. This is the story of my soul. So now turn to Psalm 51 and let's read all of it. Follow along in your Bible. Beginning in verse 1, Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to Thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken spirit and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. I will highlight here verse 10 where David said, Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit within me. Realize, friends, whenever we are sinning against God and we know it's not right, we know it interferes with our relationship, our, our communion with God, the right spirit with God is gone. It's not there anymore. We have to have that clean heart, that clean mind, that clean conscience in order for us to have the right spirit. Don't you love it how on some days you wake up and it feels like you're having a good morning. Uh, the sun is up and it's not too hot and it's not too cold. And maybe you have a little breakfast and of course you have to have the perfect cup of coffee, amen? The perfect cup of coffee and you think, oh, it's going to be a good day. 
and you spend a little time uh, praying and in your Bible and maybe you have a, a morning devotion routine and like everything's going good and then uh, that whole day you're like you're like a good person you're like the friendly version of you you're the happy version of you you're the you're the person who who loves the Lord and who loves life and loves your family and like everything is going good for you and that's what it should be like with God when we have that clean heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. That spirit that is within you and within me, it can, it can become burdened. It can become disappointed. It can become discouraged. Um, but here's the good news. It can be renewed. That spirit in you can be renewed. Um, don't you love it when uh, you've got your, your Bible, your New Testament, and you've got the Gospel track, or you have the new picture book that we gave out, or you have the other one, the laminated one, and, uh, and you talk to somebody, and you're trying to witness to them, and they seem like they have all the time needed for you. They're not in a hurry. They don't have to catch a Jeep or go to class or some other responsibility. Nobody's interrupting you. And you have all the time you need and they understand the gospel. And they listen. And they might ask a couple of questions and like everything is perfect. And everything is wonderful. And, and that's how, that's how it, it should be when everything is right. And, and when we do that with a good spirit and a good heart and a good attitude and a clean heart, that's when God can use us. Right? Because... God always wants to use a clean vessel. If you go to the kitchen out here and you want a drink, do you look to all the dirty cups with things in it and a mess or do you like take the clean cup to get your drink of cool water? You want the clean cup and God wants the clean vessel and that's us. So now we'll look at, at David, his savior. Here's a quote for you. God's love for us is not equated to our behavior. Let me say it another way. God's love for us is not tied to our behavior. God does not determine His love for you based on how good you were this morning. God does not base His love for you on how good you were last week. Because we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, we always have the full and complete love of God the, the um, access to the throne of God and access to His love. He doesn't, he, God will not hold back some of His love because you were not a perfect person today or you were not a perfect person yesterday. So our story begins with God. The Bible says in Psalm 51.1, as we've read, Have mercy upon me, O God. Because of God's mercy, David discovered the way back to God. And that's what this series is all about. There's always a way back to God. Amen. No matter what you did before, there's always a way back to God. No matter if you may trip and stumble in the days ahead, remember there is still a way back to God. In his dark hour, David had turned away from the Lord. This terrible sin had become a part of his life. And there was no one else to blame. Part of God's judgment to David was that the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Remember Nathan told him that? He told him thou art the man and he told him part of the judgment would be that that baby, that firstborn, would surely die. In 2 Samuel 2, 4, 12, 14 is where that's found. It was a year after David sinned with Bathsheba and had Uriah killed that Nathan approached David. Imagine David's thoughts when so much time had gone by and nobody talked to him about his sin. So this thing happened with Bathsheba. And um, ladies, how long does it take to know if you're pregnant on average? Eight weeks? Six weeks? Ten weeks? So almost two months go by. And then she tells him, and then you know, we talked about what he did. He sent Uriah to the front to be killed. And so David's guilty of so much. He's, he's guilty of adultery. He's guilty of murder. He's guilty of 
making Uriah drunk to try to cover up David's sin. So many things. And when Uriah was in front of the battle, there were other men there too. So several died. And David is guilty of all of that. But then uh, he thought his, his uh, plan to hide it, I guess that's, that's the natural thing. We're, we're embarrassed. We're shocked and, and we're discouraged and we don't want people to know. So try to hide it. Try to hide it. That's the natural thought. And one month went by since Uriah's death and another month and another month and another month and another and about a whole year goes by. So maybe, maybe David is thinking, okay, it was wrong what I did, but it wasn't so bad because not everybody knows about it. And then the man of God came and exposed him. We must understand that God knows and judges in his time. In verse 15, we read the child becomes very sick. And in verse 16, we read David therefore besought God for the child. David besought God. One thing you'll learn about David as you read about his life, he keeps turning back to God. He keeps asking God. He petitions God even when the child was sure to die before it happened David went to God he begged God remember he wouldn't take the food he prayed he laid on the floor he fasted he turned to God that's the right thing to do turn to God turn to God despite this terrible thing that had taken place in David's life God was approachable God is always there God is always ready to hear us. We can always go to Him. He invites us. Christ said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Matthew eleven twenty eight. In Luke 15, you read a beautiful story about a father who did not stop loving his son. God wants to teach us something about unconditional love. Amen. Unconditional love is this. Love that you do not have to earn. It is unconditional. We know that the prodigal son wasted his substance on riotous living. Luke 15, 13. He had no friends. He was living with the pigs, taking care of the pigs, and the pigs were eating better than he was. Now, I had forgotten about this, but I preached about the prodigal son before. And um, how many of you like corn? Corn on the cob. You like it? I like it when it's very sweet. Amen? Amen? And then I put butter on it. And then I, I sprinkle a little salt on it. Do you put salt on it in the film? Yeah. That's the good stuff. But I had a volunteer come once. It was a teenager who didn't know he volunteered. And he came up front, and I took the corn, and I peeled it off. The husk? Yeah. You have a name for that? Uh -huh. Yeah, the husk. And I uh, peeled it off, and I said, here, eat some. And he tried to eat it, but he couldn't eat it. I mean, it was terrible. Imagine how hungry you would have to be to eat something like the outside part, the husk of corn on the top. Not very good. So he was living with the pigs, and they were eating better than him. So he finally came to himself, the Bible says. He decided to repent. He decided to apologize to his father and go home. When you read the whole story, you see he prepared a speech for his father. But his father would not let him finish the speech. In Luke 15, 20, the Bible says, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And as you read the rest of that story, you realize he starts to tell dad all the speech. And remember, he doesn't want to be the, considered the son anymore. He wants to be a servant. Amen? When you're willing to be a servant in your own household and family, uh, that's when you've been broken. That's when God's really gotten through to your heart and you realize uh, how much you've hurt your family and your father. No matter what we've done, the moment we repent and turn to the Savior, He is waiting with open arms to receive us, to forgive us, and to help us. Next, His sin. When we call sin by name and we know it is against God, then we know we need God to forgive 
our sin. Notice the words that David used. He used these words, transgression, iniquity, and sin to describe his terrible sin. In verse 1, the last part says, blot out my transgressions. In verse 2, he says, wash me through thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. David was saying three different things. He was saying, I have rebelled. I've crossed the line away from God. That is transgression. I've left the path of righteousness for my iniquity. When we read about sin, it implies I have missed the mark. See, David is admitting all of that. I went off the path and I have missed the mark. When you are uh, a soldier or when you're an archer, you have practice with the target. And when you pull your bow and aim your arrow, you try to hit the center of the target. But when we sin against God, we are not on target. We miss the target. We're off the track. We're off the mark that God has set for us. And then David said, blot out my transgressions. When our sin is forgiven, it is covered in Christ's blood. Someday I want to get a big paper. I haven't done it yet. And I want to write on it uh, some sins. General uh, speaking, uh, lying, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, covet, covetousness, uh, stealing, etc. Anger. And then I want to get some kind of uh, paint or some kind of sponge with uh, ink on it. And I want to put it over those sins to where you cannot even see them anymore. Because that's how I imagine the, the record of sin in our lives. It's completely covered. It's completely hidden. It's completely engulfed by the blood of Christ. Never to be seen again. It is blotted out. It is gone. David said, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. He was saying, wash me. He was saying, I'm dirty. He was saying, I'm stained. So, in Bible days, you can take a bath. You can take a whole bath. And there's different ways to do it. You can be by the well and pour the water over you. And there's also some other types of bath in Bible days where someone would build a small uh, tub. And you would step in one or two steps and then you would go in the water and you could wash in the water. But once you're very clean, and then you put on clean clothes, and then you go out into the world, it's your feet that get dirty again. It's your feet that, um, that pick up the dirt and the germs and uh, the uncleanness that's there. And we have to remember that to be thoroughly clean we need to be washed again over and over. So once, once we're saved, all our sins are forgiven. But we still need to have our, our feet cleaned again. We need to be washed from any sin that happens day by day. David said, cleanse me from my sin. He wanted to be clean again. David wanted God to do whatever was necessary to cleanse him. David said, God cleanse me. God wash me. God, get rid of the stain. Think of sin as a stain in material. And in Bible days, when they did the wash, they did not have the nice detergent that we have. We have a popular one that's Tide in the U.S. for washing clothes. And you have different ones to pick from. But in Bible days, for the wash, most people would take the dirty clothes, take the one that has the stain, and put it in the water next to a big rock. And then they would put the water over it and then they, they would take another rock and they would put it on the material and wash the stain and rub it and hit it and rock between rock. I remember, I told my son, Joni, many years ago, I was on a mission trip with other uh, uh, pastors and missionaries and we were in India and we stayed at the Christian, um, there was a... Uh, area they had, a compound, a safe area with a wall, many buildings, and the people were very nice. So one person on staff, he would very quietly, we would leave our shoes by the door and walk in without our shoes, 
at night. We didn't know. He took our shoes and he washed them and he cleaned them and he polished them and he shined them. And every day we would go and our shoes looked brand new. But also we would have some laundry after a few days. And I had some new, um, some new t-shirts for traveling and they needed to be washed. And the Bible college students, the girls, would take our laundry to the river and to the rocks. And they would wash them. And they would wash them. And put soap and water and rub them with the rocks. And I got my shirts back. And it had holes. <laughs> because they, they washed them too much. <laughs> no stains because there was no material there anymore. I was amazed. But listen, David wanted God to do whatever it took, even if it means, Lord, take a rock and, and, and rub me and be abrasive and, and use what, it, what is needed, even if it's some friction to make me clean again. That's all he wanted. Make me clean again. He had this, this wonderful... Do you ever think of Adam in the Garden of Eden? Mm, that cool time in the morning? My favorite time cool time of the morning. Adam and God walking in the garden together. Wow. I think David had a relationship like that. He walked with God. He walked with God. And, and for a while, for many months, his, his heart wasn't completely clean yet. And I think he missed it. And finally, when, uh, when the prophet told him, Thou art the man, he realized he wanted to be clean again. God, do whatever is necessary so we can walk together again. The child of God should have the right attitude about sin. We are not to say, well, I'm just like everybody else. We must say, Lord, I hate my sin and I want to be right with God. I can't be right with God if I have this sin in my life. I must confess it and forsake it. We cannot understand how God forgives us, but He does. When our sin is forgiven, it is covered in the blood of Jesus, never to be seen again. It is blotted out. It is gone. Now we'll look at His sorrow. Remember the sad occasion for the writing of Psalm 51. David said in verse 3, My sin is ever before me. He was haunted by the memory that others had suffered because of his sin. Other warriors were killed along with Uriah because they were so close to the enemy's wall that the archers were able to shoot their arrows into the hearts of those mighty warriors. What a waste of human life to cover one man's sin. There is horror in sin. It is a guilt that haunts people. It is inescapable. When we least expect it, the thought of sin creeps into the mind. The story of David's soul is the story of his Savior. The story of his sin and the story of his sorrow. But it does not stop there. There is a God in heaven who is merciful, who forgives sin. Amen? We all have our sorrow, but when we give our sorrow to the Savior, he can give us a new beginning in life, a song in our heart, and make our life over again. Here's another quote for you. God is a loving God. His heart hurts when we sin against Him. So here are three things to remember. The way back to God. When we sin, we must turn to the Lord and come to Him, knowing that His love for us has not changed. Amen for that. Amen for that. I, I don't know how people who believe in a different doctrine and think that if they sin at all, they have completely lost their salvation and they have to continuously be saved again day after day after day after day. That just, that just doesn't compute. And it's not what the Bible teaches. Because there, sooner or later there will be a time where you make an offense to God, where you sin against God, but you don't realize it. So then there would be a sin on your account, but you haven't confessed it. And then it just doesn't work, does it? Next, call sin what it is and confess it to God to find forgiveness and cleansing. That's number two. Last one, the way back to God. Take all sin seriously. 
in your own life, remember that all sin hurts the heart of God. Amen. 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 A good series on Psalm 51. A good series on finding our way back to God. Everybody you know, everybody you know, believer, non-believer, we need a clear way to God. We need a, a, uh, an unobstructed path back to God. Amen? So I pray this is profitable for you. Let's get ready for a short invitation time and have a word of prayer. You can stand. Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this truth that we looked at tonight. Thank you, God, that you were able to use something terrible in the life of David, but open it up for the world and for us to see. And Father, how, how touched my heart is to see that David was uh, tender and willing to do whatever it took and have you do whatever it took to make his heart clean again. Father, I pray that we'll desire more than anything to walk with you, to have a clean heart with you, and to feel a close fellowship and communion with you and other believers. Lord, I pray that you'll uh, continue to bless the ministry here. Speak to hearts. Thank you for folks that uh, love you and are willing to uh, sacrifice for you and serve you. And Father, I pray that we'll do whatever we can to make sure our hearts are right with you and that what we're doing is pleasing in your sight. Amen.